I'm here in New York City and behind me is the World Trade Center Memorial. The memorial commemorates the events of September 11th, where 3,000 people died and the World Trade Center was destroyed. It's been about 17 years now. There are plenty of people who don't remember the event because they weren't old enough or weren't even born at that point. How do you design a memorial that speaks to the victims' families, but also to those who don't have a direct experience with the event? How do you design a memorial that's relevant 50, 100, 200 years from now? And how do you do all of that while creating a functional public space in Lower Manhattan? It's not an easy task, and it's something New York has grappled with in the aftermath of the disaster. This video takes you back to that time, to those discussions, to figure out how they went from rubble to this memorial. The September 11th terrorist attacks are well known for completely destroying both one and two World Trade Center, but the collapse of the towers destroyed all of the buildings in the World Trade Center complex, as well as many other buildings nearby. The entire 16-acre site, known as Ground Zero, was covered in rubble and debris that took nine months to clear out. With the entire World Trade Center gone, the question became, what's next for the site? And who got to decide what was next? The question of who was in charge was difficult. There were many stakeholders involved in Ground Zero decision-making. First of all, we have the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. The Port Authority is a public entity that operates the bridges and tunnels in the region, and it also built and operated the World Trade Center and the PATH rail station below it. In July of 2001, three months before the attacks, they leased the World Trade Center to real estate mogul Larry Silverstein for 99 years in an effort to divest itself of its non-transportation assets. Larry Silverstein had the World Trade Center insured for $3.5 billion, $2 billion more than the Port Authority, which proved fortuitous. Because Silverstein agreed to pay the Port Authority $120 million per year in rent and had the insurance money, he was determined to replace the office space lost in the attack. But that insurance money wasn't going to pay for all of the damages to Lower Manhattan, such as the destruction of the path and subway stations and other public spaces. The entity created to pay for those costs was the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation. This organization, formed by the city and the state as a public corporation, was tasked with dispersing federal funds to help rebuild the site. The LMDC spearheaded two major design efforts. They held a small competition to choose a design and a designer for the overall master plan of Ground Zero. They also conducted a design competition for the memorial. While the selection of the final memorial design would be made by a 13-member jury, the victims' families would be an influential group. They remained influential through the entire process and even gave input on such details as the items sold in the 9-11 Museum's gift shop. They are also, obviously, a primary audience for the World Trade Center Memorial itself. Those are the major stakeholders I'm going to discuss in this video, but I want to mention here that there are many other people who had and deserved input on the rebuilding process, including Lower Manhattan businesses and residents and others affected by the attack. The four stakeholder groups all had different viewpoints and agendas, but three concrete steps emerged from the early days of the rebuilding efforts. First, the site would be largely rebuilt. All of the transportation infrastructure and office buildings would be back. Second, the site would be rebuilt according to a master plan. Three, there would be a memorial, and the LMDC would be leading a competition to determine its design. This all seems really reasonable. There was a whole, we have to rebuild sentiment among the public, and Larry Silverstein was going to rebuild no matter the sentiment. And no attack of this magnitude could go without some sort of physical memorial. They say the devil's in the details, though, and this was no exception. Let's talk about the efforts to rebuild the buildings first. The LMDC held a competition for the site plan and chose Daniel Liebskin's bold proposal for the site back in 2003. His original plan called for skyscrapers with gardens above the 64th floors and an iconic, asymmetrical, 1776-foot skyscraper that sort of invoked the Statue of Liberty. Governor Pataki dubbed it the Freedom Tower. Liebskin reserved much of the site for a future memorial. The entire plan consisted of about 10 million square feet of office space, a half a million square feet of retail, reconstruction of the train stations, the 9-11 Museum, and the Memorial. Liebskin's plan went through some substantial revisions throughout the process that led to numerous conflicts and challenges. Perhaps the largest, both figuratively and literally, was the debate over the Freedom Tower. Liebskin's bold design for the tower sold the LMDC, but it didn't sell Larry Silverstein. In fact, by the time Liebskin had been chosen to do the site plan, Silverstein had hired David Childs to design the tower. The problem was that the public had seen Liebskin's design for the building, and reasonably expected that's what would be built. Liebskin himself felt that he should be the architect and represented the will of the people. Eventually, all parties came to an agreement that Childs would remain the architect, but Liebskin would have some input. By the time it was built, though, just about all that was left of Liebskin's design was the symbolic height. Not all of the design changes were because of Childs' differing vision. The NYPD requested changes to make the building safer, 
And as a result, the bottom part of the building is essentially a massive concrete bunker. The habitable space doesn't really start until about 15 floors up. The memorial design also faced challenges. Again, the LMDC held a competition for the memorial in 2003. They received over 5,000 submissions and narrowed it down to the top eight. In January 2004, they selected Reflecting Absence by Michael Arad. The focal point of the memorial are two fountains that approximate the footprints of one and two World Trade Center. In the original design, Arad designed ramps to lead people down to the pools. Below ground, there would be exhibit areas and spaces for contemplation. The challenges around the memorial stem primarily with the process of conforming the initial design to budgetary, security, and symbolic concerns. Arad's design ignored Liebskin's master plan for an entirely below-ground memorial and opted instead for a memorial primarily at street level. Arad's vision won out, and in fact, some of the subterranean parts of the memorial, like the ramps, were value-engineered out of the final memorial design. The question of where to place the names of the victims' families, how to order them, and how to group them caused some challenges between the designers and victims' families. That process took years. Some of Arad's initial ideas persisted through the final design, like the fountain that starts as hundreds of individual streams and merges into one sheet of water at the bottom, symbolizing individual and collective grief and loss. The inset fountains represent death, while the trees above ground represent life. The final result, perhaps unsurprisingly, has been met with some mixed reviews. It has been called a well-designed plaza, while others believe the memorial reflects the bland modernism of the entire site. But, as I asked in the beginning of the video, is it an effective memorial? Will it stand the test of time? Memorials are always a product of the time they are built in. Not that long ago, memorials were often fairly literal. Think sculptures of fallen generals. Memorials like the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. helped usher in a more conceptual idea of a memorial, designed to make the visitor feel something instead of simply see it. The World Trade Center Memorial is clearly conceptual, and this may be a strength. Visitors of all kinds can project their own meaning onto it, but the fountains at the footprints of the towers will always link it directly to the attacks. The memorial design and the site reconstruction faced numerous challenges between all stakeholders during the redevelopment process. The results may not have been a perfect fit for any one stakeholder, but at least Michael Elrod and Daniel Liebskind have made peace with the process and results. Says Liebskind, it is a moving space, a space that doesn't shift New York to a pessimistic register, where there's an imbalance, where people feel sad, but a space that has a fantastic character. It's a total transformation, as I actually envisioned it, and as I think New Yorkers wanted it to be. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem-solving website that teaches you to think critically by taking complicated concepts like the one presented in this video, break them into bite-sized nuggets, present clear thinking in each part, and then build them back up to an interesting conclusion. To unlock this superpower of understanding the universe, go to brilliant.org slash citybeautiful and sign up for free. And also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. If you made it to the end of the video, maybe you love art and architecture. You would probably also love Betty's channel, Articulations. Hi, I'm Betty from Articulations. And yeah, if you like memorials and public art, I made a video on my channel about the Rainbow Tunnel in Toronto, so go check it out. Link in the description, thanks.